Meanwhile, we are learning new details tonight on a nursing home tragedy and what went on in the hours and days before eight residents of the Rehabilitation Center at Hollywood Hills died. We have CBS 4 News team coverage on the story. Let's begin with CBS 4 investigator Jim DeFeedy. And Jim, this is making national headlines. Everybody wants to know all the questions in between the timeline of how this could have happened. How did eight residents of a nursing home go unnoticed that they were overheated? So up until right now, what we've done is we've heard from city officials, we've heard from state officials, we've heard from FPNL. We haven't really heard yet from the facility itself. Today, they put out a brief timeline, a limited timeline, showing the events. We're going to get to that in a second. But in digging around, CBS 4 News has uncovered some new information related to the, what went on behind the scenes. We can now report that in the 36 hours prior to the first death at the nursing home, officials at the nursing home called an emergency number for Governor Rick Scott on three separate occasions during that 36-hour period, saying they needed immediate assistance. They were in trouble and they needed help. What happened to those calls to the governor? Well, we're not sure and we're still trying to find out, but clearly the help did not come. Now let's go back to FPNL for a second. And let's, put a, let's start with the first full screen because I want to sort of walk you through a little bit of background first. First thing you need to know is that this facility had two FBL transformers. One of the transformers, one powers the life safety systems. The second powers the air conditioning units. All right, now let's see what happened on, on Sunday, September 10th, when the storm struck. The power goes out at around 3 p.m. Now, a generator is able to keep the life safety systems on, but the power to the air conditioning unit goes out. So the first call from the facility to FPNL, we can now report, occurred at 3.49 p.m., and an emergency ticket was created. All right, now let's go to the next day, Monday. FBNL was uh, told them on repeated occasions that somebody would be there first thing in the morning. No one showed up in the morning. They then said they were coming in the afternoon according to the nursing home. No one came. And I will tell you that the nursing home officials were taking notes of everyone they talked to and the times they talked to them. And then they were told finally that they would come in the afternoon. Still no one came. And it's important now to note, it was on Monday, it was during this mess in which they were unable to get FPNL to respond, that they first contacted Governor Rick Scott at a special number he had created. Governor Scott had had an emergency call in the week prior to Hurricane Irma landing with healthcare officials and saying, if any of you, any of your hospitals, nursing homes, ALFs have trouble, call this number and I will fix the problem. They called at approximately, let me get the right time, it was at about oh, 5.34 p.m. They called the governor and they were not able to get any response. All right, so now let's go to the next day. This is Tuesday. All right, now on Tuesday, again, they were being promised that FPNL would come out and FPL did not come out. Again, they called the governor's office two more times on this day. In addition to that, they were also contacting the Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee, and they have records of their calls to the Emergency Operations Center saying they were in dire need of assistance. And yet still, they kept being told that somebody would be out soon, that their ticket was being raised as a higher priority, that they were being placed on a, on a, on a more urgent basis. But time and time again, no one came until finally we end up on Wednesday. This is when early Wednesday morning is when the deaths start occurring. The first phone calls start coming in at around 1, 2 a.m. in the morning of people having distress, cardiac arrest, and then it flows from there. In, the, in one incredible span that we're now learning about, they came at 4.30 a.m. at 911 call, a patient in a cardiac arrest. That patient had a DNR, meaning do not resuscitate. So when the paramedics arrived, they did not try to resuscitate the person, let that person die. But while those paramedics were there, another patient had a heart attack. They began to resuscitate that person and were able to get them to a hospital. And that's when now the word sort of went out. So, you know, this is, this is a system where oh, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing and a lot of emphasis is going to be placed on the hospital, but there are certainly questions that need to be raised about how FPNL handled this and how the governor's staff handled this. Today we got a statement from FPNL. Let me read you part of it. What we now know is that a portion of the facility did in fact have power, that there were a hospital with a power across the parking lot from this facility, and that the nursing home was required to have a permanently installed operational generator. In March, we met with Broward County officials to identify top critical facilities that require priority power restoration. 
While this nursing home was given a level of priority, in working with county officials, other critical facilities such as hospitals and 911 centers were identified as higher priorities. Now that's almost verbatim the same statement they issued right. on day one. Right. You know, and so again, it begs the question, what makes something a high priority? At the time that this incident occurred, you have to remember, when the first patients were dying, there were 150 other nursing homes around the state that did not have power. And as of earlier today, I think the number was still in the 30s that still do not have power across the state of Florida. Jim, what about this call to the, these calls, I should say, sure. to the governor's office that you say started on Monday? Started on Monday and then two more on Tuesday. Again, this was a line that the governor, he held a series of these conference calls with emergency officials, maybe more than 100 people on the line. And he would say, look, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. If any of you have an issue, you can't, and you need it expedited, call this number. They called the number on three different occasions. They would get a call back from someone at the emergency operations center and say, okay, we've heard your concern. We're on it. We'll take care of it. Right. But nothing would have happened. That's what, that was going to be my question. Who picks up that phone call? So it's the emergency operations center? No. It, it, I'll be honest with you. I called that number. When they called the number, they said it went straight to a voicemail. When I called it today, it went straight to a voicemail. So okay. many, so many questions, especially the fact that there was a hospital right across the yes. street from this facility, and we still haven't heard about any calls to 911. At what time? When did that finally yeah. happen? All right. All right. Unacceptable. We'll, yeah, we'll be following the story more closely with uh, Jim Defeaty coming up. Thank you, Jim.